We're talking today with Ted Weatherhead of Wayland, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Now, Ted, can you start us off with some background on yourself? Uh, to begin with, where and when were you born? Well, I was born in Columbus, Ohio, <clears throat> on March 13, 1923. And we lived there for a short time and moved to Cleveland, Ohio. And we lived there for a while. And then from Cleveland, uh, let's see, uh, we moved to, uh, to, to since, since, well, I wasn't, I think it's Cincinnati, but I'm not sure. And my assistant right behind you will help. And from Cincinnati, we moved to South Bend, Indiana. South Bend, Indiana to Lakewood, Ohio. Lakewood, Ohio to Euclid, Ohio. And it, I graduated from high school in, in Euclid, Ohio. All right. So why all of the moving around? Well, my mother and father divorced, mm -hmm. and that split things up, and my mother went to get a job someplace, and my father went someplace else. And those places are the mm -hmm. ones I've mentioned. Now, did you stay with your mother, or did you go back and forth? Mother. Okay. All right. Uh, now, um, did you have any brothers or sisters? I had one sister, Mary. She was a year and a half older than I. Mm -hmm. she, they didn't keep her. They sent her to a private school. Okay. The two of them together did that, and I stayed with my mother. All right. Uh, and how well did you do in school with all that bouncing around? Oh, I, I was uh, maybe a little better than average, but not a whole lot. Okay. And then when did you finish high school? I finished high school in 1941. And I, I think the best I did in high school was uh, National, National Honor Society, and that was about it. Okay. Uh, did you play any sports or things like that? Oh, or? yes. I played basketball, football, track. All right. And then what did you do after you graduated? Well, I went immediately to o Ohio University. And I wanted to play basketball. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, what Ohio U was good at at that time. So uh, I went there in a short time and then, then uh, Pearl Harbor. Okay. Now, before Pearl Harbor happened, uh, were you aware at all of what was happening in the world, war in Europe, that kind of thing? Not very much. I was pretty much out of it. I was in the basketball world, mm -hmm. but, but aside from that, I, I, I really wasn't with it. Okay. And then how did you learn about Pearl Harbor? Sunday morning, coming home from church. The radios in our dorm were all blaring. Pearl Harbor is being bombed as we speak. And... Uh, all of all, everybody's dorm had this on just full blast, and we were just all just taken aback. All right, and then what was your reaction to that? You learned the news, and what did you oh, do next? We, we, most all of us just right away we wanted to go get the Japanese. That was our single goal in life, most of us, and and many of us were getting ready to go home for Christmas. This being December seventh when mm -hmm. this occurred, and uh, so a lot of us we we went home and we signed up. I did. I signed up in the Air Corps, as right. it was known then. Okay. Uh, you, then after you go to the recruiting station, you sign up, what happens next? Well, they told me it'd be a little wait for a while, so, but then the school, I, we went right away to the school people and say, what's, what's your attitude on folks that are waiting to, to go to the service? And they say, are you signed up? And we said, yes. Well, we're, we're really, uh, you're on your own, virtually, if you want to work hard, do it, if you don't, we, we won't count it, you know. And that's why I was a won't count it type of guy, I wanted to study basketball. So did you stay in school then and wait I for... I stayed in school. Okay, and then when did you actually get called up? I got called up in uh, 1942, and uh, I'm not sure, about the fall of 42. Okay, so you got to complete... <clears throat> sort of the, the spring term or whatever yeah. at Ohio U, mm -hmm. uh, and then you, you go, you were back in school again at the time you got called up? Yes, uh, I don't remember. Okay. I can't, I can't answer. All right. Uh, and you do get called up, then where do they send you then? To San Antonio, the classification center in San Antonio. I was there for about eight or nine weeks, and from there they took us to pre-flight in San Antonio. Okay. And uh, now, in the, that classification center, were you doing the equivalent of Army basic training at the that's time? That's it. Learning how to march, learning how to uh, do the things they do in the Army. Mm -hmm. Now, was it easy or hard for you to adjust to that? No, not really. It was 
A bunch of guys, we get along good. Did they put a lot of emphasis on discipline and following orders? Oh yes, and, uh, and we had to we had to toe the line. I mean that was part of it. But those of us have, who had had that at home we didn't find that much of a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, and were you also taking tests to determine what you would do next? Oh yes, and physical tests and mental tests and oh, coordinate coordination tests of all sorts, and they were doing the classifying into bombardiers, navigators, pilots, and that was what was happening. All right. Now, what did you want to do? I wanted to be a pilot. Okay. And did you care what you flew? Well, I was kind of a fighter type guy. Most everybody was, and uh, so that's what I put down as my first choice. All right. Uh, now you, so you basically you spend the eight, eight nine weeks there at classification center. Uh, you make the cut for pilot training or at least for the first stage that's of it. Right, that's right. All right, so now you do pre-flight, and that's still in San Antonio. That's still in San Antonio, okay. but basically about flying, about mm -hmm. being a pilot. Now, what did the course consist of? Oh, uh, physics of flight. Uh, we had the, uh, uh, all the theory of flying, which took most of a good bit of nav uh, navigation training and, and uh, Weather. We had to study weather quite a bit. Those are the main things we did. Mm -hmm. And we were in class most every day. Okay. So that you weren't actually in aircraft or, or simulators no. or things no. like that yet? No, this is just classroom work. We didn't even see planes. We saw a lot of phys ed. I didn't, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of PT, or phys physical training. All right. And about how long did that? Nine weeks. Okay, another nine weeks. Classification, nine weeks. Mm -hmm. Pre-flight, nine weeks. Uh, our primary flight, nine weeks, mm -hmm. basic flight, nine weeks, and advanced, nine weeks. Okay. Now, did you go straight through that, or were there interruptions along the way? No, no Once I started flying, and, and that we, uh, we started flying uh, at the end of pre-flight, I never stopped. Okay. So uh, then, was it primary training comes next, primary flight training? Mm -hmm. uh, now, was that still in San Antonio, or do you go no, somewhere else? That was in... Uh, It was west of San Antonio. It was in the home of John Nance Garner. Uvalde. Uvalde, Texas. Okay. Was there for nine weeks. Lovely, lovely time. And we were so kind to, to the, all of us in the, in the flight school. And we had dinner with them every Sunday night. And everything. Just very nice to us. So was this just a small facility? Yes. Okay. So not a big, big base with lots of soldiers around. No, no. Around. This was a small facility. I can't recall how many planes, but... Uh, I, I would say a hundred or less. Okay. Now, what kind of aircraft did you start off with? PT-19A. And can you describe the plane? Fairchild, low wing, single engine, uh, just a good basic flight training. Okay. Now, had you ever been in an airplane before that? Yes, I had. Uh, as a high school, where I used to go to the airport on the weekends and wash planes and get flight, mm -hmm. and get a flight for free flight for that, doing that, you know. I used to wash guys' planes and shine them up. And stuff. Okay. Uh, and then what was it like to actually get the controls of a plane for the first time? Oh, that's great. You know, I felt like I could do it right away and then found out I couldn't. <laughs> that's about how it happened. All right. Uh, now, at, at that, at, at primary yeah. level, uh, did you start to have people who, who would wash out or have trouble? Oh, we had a lot of washouts. I'd say 50%. Yeah, 50 percent. Some was caused by uh, just getting nervous when they get up in the air. They just were just nervous. Some were caused by pilot, uh, student, not uh, getting along too well. There are several reasons why they wasn't all just bad flyers. It was. Yeah, what sort of people did they have training you at that stage? They were, they were good people, most of them. Uh, none of them. None of them. Uh, Great pilots, I wouldn't say, but uh, just your normal, run-of-the-day people. They were good folks. Were they civilian instructors or All military? All civilian. Okay. All right. Had had military uh, flight check people. Every time we have a flight check, it'd be military person. And what was a flight check? Flight check would be to try landings, uh, stalls, do uh, chandelles, do lazy eights, things like this. Those are the things that the the uh, the uh, officers would check us, okay. and the officers were mostly 
uh, second lieutenant, first lieutenant, captain. Okay. So basically, the, the military is the one determining that you're good enough to go on to the next level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think the civilian people recommend that you mm -hmm. do or you mm -hmm. don't. You know, right. they recommend it when you were to get when you were going to get washed out before a check. That would be a recommendation by the civilian. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have nine weeks of that, and then do they move you again for basic? They moved us to uh, Waco, Texas, to a basic flight school where we flew. BT-13A, made by Volte, called the Volte Vibrator. Now, was it still a single engine plane? Or? Single engine plane, pretty good size engine though, it was up around 500 horsepower, and we could do slow rolls, loops, uh, uh, all kinds of acrobatics. We, we had to do those things, we had to do them well. To, to pass. Okay. And now, were you having, were there people having accidents at this stage, or were they mostly doing well, okay? I think there were probably some accidents. I didn't know about them, though. Mm -hmm. It was, it wasn't a thing that was pressed on our mind at all. Right. Now, the people who had gotten through primary now, are you going through with the same group of men? Yes, we stay with the same guys just about all the time. Okay. And once they had weeded out the first group, did most of the ones at this level stay in? I'd say so. Most of them. A few would wash out for various reasons. Uh, we, had, uh, we, had a, uh, 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 we had a bunch of guys got polio. A bunch, maybe four or five mm -hmm. guys, since we had people washed out because of that. That was a little surprising yeah. to us. All right, uh, and so you, kind of, you get through that now. Did you do all your flying during the day? All the flying was during the day at that point, yes. Our flights were daytime flights. Mm -hmm. We had cross-country flights. We'd go quite a ways away and, uh, from the base, and, and we'd land and have lunch, something like that, and get back mm -hmm. in, come on, come on back. We did cross-countries cross with an instructor at first, and then after a little while, they instructor sat it out and we'd go by the cross countries by ourselves. Okay. And would you fly solo or would there be two of you in the plane and you just take turns? Solo. Okay. Solo. All right. Never flew uh, two in the plane with other than a, an instructor. Okay. Now did you uh, get grounded for weather? Would bad weather keep you down? Texas is beautiful flying weather. Mm -hmm. it was, uh, it was, if it was bad weather our flight would get canceled. But but we flew when then we got scheduled. When we were scheduled, we flew mm -hmm. because the weather is that good. Okay. All right. Uh, so now we're kind of making it into 1943 here, and you're going from base to base. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have your nine weeks of basic, and then what's your next step after that? Advanced. And we were our class was 44A. Mm -hmm. January 7th was preset date for our graduation. <coughs> So there, there was nothing arbitrary about mm -hmm. when you were going to get done. You knew when you were going to get done, nine weeks later. See. And we started flying, uh, we started flying, nor, um, can't think of which plane it is. It's a North American plane, I believe it was. It, was, uh, it, was a, uh, uh, it wasn't an AT-6, which is a North American and mm -hmm. the most popular advanced trainer. We were mm -hmm. in advance now. But I was put into an advanced school, two engines, mm -hmm. and that was uh, that was against my wishes. But that's that's the way it was done. And I flew this plane for maybe of the nine weeks. I maybe flew it three or four weeks, and then we got some uh, we got some C forty sevens in, mm -hmm. and we started flying them for about six uh, weeks, five or six weeks. No, I'd be up to nine now. It'd be about three or four weeks. Mm -hmm. And then they brought in some uh, North American uh, B-25s, the same as Jimmy Doolittle right. did the bombing with. Only these planes had been fitted with 55 millimeter cannons, and they couldn't they couldn't shoot the cannon and fly the plane. The cannons would stop the plane. The, re the recoil was so big, so they took the cannons out, and sent them to advance for us to fly, and, and get some time. And that, and that was pretty interesting flying for us. We thought, you know. We do uh, single engine takeoffs and uh, you know various various mild things compared to basic. We where we were mm -hmm. doing all kinds of fancy stuff at basic, but advanced we just flew uh, straight stuff. A lot of 
just across countries. Mm -hmm. Okay. So was your your whole unit then now flying twin engine planes? Mm -hmm. So you class forty four A was going to do that. Better. Transports or bombers? Bunch the whole way. Okay. Uh, now, as you're bouncing around from uh, base to base here, uh, what was your off duty life like? What else was going on at that time? Uh, I, I don't know. We, uh, I, I don't remember in training. We, 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 had, we did a lot of studying. You know, mm -hmm. when we weren't flying, we were studying the flight theories and stuff like that because we'd get quizzed fairly frequently. I don't recall much of social life. My, not when I, like when we got overseas, the social life took off. Mm -hmm. But in training, we didn't have much social life. Okay. Well, when did you get married? We got married about four weeks after uh, Japan capitulated. Okay, so you were you engaged during this time, or would that uh, come later? Or? No, not really. We we wrote once in a while, but that's about it. Okay, so you sort of had a girlfriend back home, but it yeah. hadn't gotten to that point yet. Okay. But then I have and overseas. You have a girlfriend one night and mm -hmm. a girlfriend the next night, and so. Forth. All right. I'm just asking the part because you have a picture album and there's pictures of, of your future sure. wife in there from <coughs> that, that period of time. Okay. Uh, but basically, so so you really just kind of focused mostly on the business of learning how to fly. And, and at training school, it yeah. was that way. But it, once we got in, in uh, uh, when we were doing missions, like we'd fly to France or to mm -hmm. Germany or someplace like that during the day, and then uh, then at night we, we didn't do a whole lot, uh, play poker, maybe mm -hmm. something like that. But on weekends, we'd take off for the city. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, over the course of the time as they're moving you from school to school, did you get any leave time? Did you get to go home at all? Uh, no. In the, in the schooling, never. We, we never had a day off that I could think of. Uh, on Sundays we could go have dinner with some people like mm -hmm. uh, in Uvalde, as I was mentioning, but uh, we, we didn't have uh, we didn't get time off mm -hmm. during the week at all, or weekends, either one. Mm -hmm. But in, in once we got into a combat situation, we had weekends. You know. now, did you get a furlough before they sent you overseas? Got a four-week furlough, and uh, uh, we, I was sick a good bit of the time. I got trench mouth somewhere or other, and uh, so I was homesick for about three weeks. But uh, yeah, but I got a four week, and then we we all got back together, got new airplanes at uh, South Bend, Indiana. We got brand new C 47s and they decided we would fly the southern route to Europe. So we took off from uh, South Bend, Indiana, and flew to uh, uh, Gold Coast, I think it was, or help me with that now. I think it was. Uh, did you go to Brazil so, or? No, we went, we went to Brazil, but we went first of all to down and to... What? You took off from Fort Wayne to West Palm? To West Palm Park. Beach, and then from there to Barrinquin Field, Puerto Rico, and from there to Natal, Brazil, mm -hmm. and from Natal, Brazil to Ascension Island, and from Ascension Island to the Gold Coast of Africa, and from there to Marrakesh, Morocco, mm -hmm. and we stayed there for about a week or so from bad weather. We're getting into near England now. Okay. Now, have we left out any stages in, in the training process? You've gotten to the point where you were training in B-25s and C-47s, uh, and then did you do anything else before the furlough and being shipped out? No. That's okay. About it. Okay, so that's the sequence. Uh, we didn't uh, know. We didn't have any transition. Mm -hmm. tra with that came after we got back from the four-week leave. Mm -hmm. We had four weeks, four and a half weeks of transition, and that was because there had been a uh, an incident in in Italy where our Navy shot down 19 C-47s full of paratroopers, and that loss of 19 planes put a, a big jump in the, our our military, and then had to get some pilots in a hurry mm -hmm. to replace all these guys, and they had to get planes in a hurry, and that that thing changed our transition altogether. Instead of nine weeks of transition, which was normal, we had four and a half weeks. And then we got planes as co-pilots and flew overseas. Okay. Now, on a C-47 crew, how many men are there? Well, there's just a pilot, co-pilot, uh, radio operator, and, and crew chief. Okay. 
uh, but on going overseas, every plane had a navigator. Okay, so there'd be five of you on the plane. Okay. Now, what was it like making this long set of jumps to, oh, to get over it, to Europe? It was from Natal to Ascension was a kind of a scary one. That was a, a distant flight, and uh, and Ascension was having German submarines surface 100 miles north or 100 miles south and using the homing signal that Ascension was using and to home in on them, and then they'd shoot you down with uh, any aircraft. So we were, we wanted a good navigator on that one, <laughs> and we, uh, the, the, the tone, the signal they gave was just as clear, just as bright as Ascension signal, mm -hmm. so we had to know where we were going, and that's why we had to have that, that navigator, we wanted him. Okay. Then, so the German submarine would give its own signal and try to draw you to it? And they did it. They, they, were, they got several of our clients doing that, you know, All right. but that, that was kind of a scary thing. So then we went there from there, from there to Africa to Morocco was, was a piece of cake. Really, we just stayed there. We were there for for Easter at, at Marrakesh. Marrakesh is not much of a town. Yeah, I mean, what was? Did you get to see much of anything when you no, stopped we, in these places? We would we would be dying to get in to start with, but when you once you've been there, you you've seen everything you want to see. At least that's the way most of us felt about. We'd stay mm -hmm. on the base and do some study and, and uh, hope to hear that we're going to go to England. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so you were in Marrakesh for about a week or so. Okay, now is the next stop England at that point? Valley Wales. We had to go into Wales first mm -hmm. and then from Valley Wales to Cottesmore, England. Mm -hmm. And we had an English base. It was made for the uh, English Air Force. And they turned the whole base over to us. And it was an excellent situation. We had apartments and kitchens and we had just very nice living quarters and eating quarters. Mm -hmm. Good place. All right. Uh, did you have um, any English personnel or civilians working on the base or was it just all Americans on the base? Oh, we had uh, laundry people and stuff like that were, were domestic people mm -hmm. or were uh, local people. The rest were all, all Americans. Mm -hmm. Now what part of England was this in? Near, uh, kind of halfway between uh, uh, Nottingham and Leicester. Mm -hmm. It was up in the middle. Yeah. Okay. And uh, were you doing training up there or were you now flying missions? Oh, we were training a good deal before D Day. We flew all the time and we had a, one horrible incident. We, we'd go out as a whole group at nighttime. We flew almost all night flying because the drop was going to be made at night. You know? And we had a route we took, which was just 180 degrees off of, of what the route was that we actually took, which unbeknownst to us. Mm -hmm. And one night, uh, we had a group, we had a squadron, it wasn't a, squ a group, it was a squadron, which was about uh, 36 planes or something like that, ran head into, a, uh, right into another one. And the leaders of both squadrons were killed and several others were injured and the planes were just flying all over the place because all they're all V of V's, you know, we had four V of V's be mm -hmm. behind each one and these all these planes were just scattered all over. Very scary situation. We we all go went back to our field by ourselves and landed and and we all had to be debriefed as to what happened and mm -hmm. as they tried to find out what did happen, you know. That was a that was a kind of a bad incident. And so they changed some policies after that. Flights would be further apart, mm -hmm. but we still had to fly at night. Right. And we started what they call night flying school, or night night vision school. And they took a gymnasium and land, uh, had light, white lines all over the floor of this gym, gym, gymnasium. And they started out with the lights at a certain level, and they, uh, this, this went on for five or six weeks, and each night the lighting level would be just a little bit less than it was the night before, and we were having to eat copious quantities of carrots <laughs> raw and, uh, and to try to improve our night vision. And I think they, I think they did improve it. it we, we felt as though they improved it. All right. Now, when you were doing these training missions, were you carrying paratroopers with you? or? Uh, no, generally not. but. Maybe once in a month we would carry paratroopers, 
but the rest of the time we were just the planes alone and the pilots and co-pilots and crew chief and radio operator. Okay. And, uh, but we flew every night just about that you could fly, which wasn't every night in England, yeah. it was maybe half the night. Okay. Did you also learn to tow gliders? Oh yeah, yeah we did. We had learned that back in the States, we'd had very little of them, but we'd had enough to, you know, that we took off with gliders and so forth. Yeah. Glider pilots were, as I mentioned in my write-up, were short of training, though they weren't really well trained. They, they, they didn't know the physics of flight, and they, they just, they just, they could fly, and that was about it. And we had a good bit of trouble with glider pilots always wanting to uh, fly above you to get out of the prop wash. You know, they want to raise up, mm -hmm. and so that would pull the tail of the plane up, the, of the pull the tow plane. So we'd start, we'd have to tell them to get down and get into the prop wash where you belong. And then we pulled double gliders, and then they'd want to split. And you got the same physics problem again. Mm -hmm. as, as the further apart they went, the, the, you know, the, the harder it get to tow them. You know, when they, if they'd stay close together, we could tow them easily. But when they got way far apart, it was tough to tow them. And we'd say, get together, fellas, or we're going to cut you loose. So did you have radio contact with the glider pilots? Yes. Okay. Very short radio, not, no distance. Right. Uh, and I guess maybe you don't practice too many times with gliders because gliders break? Oh, yes. We, uh, as I mentioned in this right, they, they put the, the Germans drilled uh, far, all farm fields, they drill these holes, maybe three to four in, foot, foot deep, and we'd, they'd drop in six by six pieces of lumber or pieces of trees or something like that. And when the gliders had hit those, they'd land and hit those things that break the glider up or it would hurt the, mm -hmm. the, the participants. Yeah. So, uh, but in training you wouldn't have that. Oh, no, 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 not in training. But this, this was an actual, right. after, right. The, after the invasion, mm -hmm. after D-Day, mm -hmm. uh, this would be the case. Okay. But in training it was nothing like that. All right. Now, uh, when did you get to England? Was it March got or to April? I England in, uh, in uh, about the 1st of April. Okay. Uh, now, on the days when there was bad weather or that kind of thing, could you go into town or into the pubs no, or things no, like that, or you just stayed where you were? We wait for good weather. Okay. That's, uh, we, was, we were ready where the crew was ready, the plane was loaded, everything. You'd wait, and when, if you got a break in the weather, you took off. <clears throat> so I guess you're close enough to the invasion now that you're pretty well kept on the bases? Yeah, we were pretty well kept on the base, and uh, we, we, would, uh, we would have to go through a, a routine of what we're going to do when the flight. We, we, you know, we, did that, we did nothing with the path of flight. They never touched that. And then we didn't know that what this flight we've been flying was the path of flight. You know that we've been training on all the time, except 180 degrees off. But we had a lot of a lot of uh, uh, sessions. You know what you to do when this happens. What you do when that happens. All right. Uh, now, the as they were, they were planning D-Day, there was always the question of what the weather was going to be like. Uh, the initial plan was to go on the 5th of June rather than the 6th. the 6th. Now, how far into the preparation to go did you get um, on the night of the 4th, 5th? I'd say on the night of the 4th, the day of the 4th, yeah. before the 5th, we went through the, well, the whole routine. I mean, we were every, every detail that we could think of mm -hmm. we brought up and was, we questioned. Did they tell you at that point what the route was going to be, or was that the, no. the 5th when they told you that? That the night of the, the, the night of the briefing for the drop, right. they told us you just turn to the left 180 degrees instead of to the right, and that was our route. And <coughs> we uh, we all we all had lousy weather that day, but uh, we went. All right. Now uh, describe sort of what happens that night. I mean, was it a normal day until you got the briefing, or? Well, we knew that you know, from the from the experience of the day before, we knew it was coming, so mm -hmm. we were all like, like this, you know, we didn't sleep good or anything like that. But we went into the briefing about, uh, oh, let's see, we took off at about midnight, we went into the briefing about 9.30 or 10, something like that, and we briefed for an hour and a half, two hours, and then went to the planes, 
got our paratroopers. We left. We didn't have any para, uh, troop gliders then. Right. We had all paratroopers. Okay. And <coughs> what unit were the paratroopers you had from? We were with the uh, 405th uh, uh, part of the 82nd Airborne. We okay. had 82nd Airborne 405th Regiment, I believe. Mean. Well, the probably 505th. 505th. Yeah. Yeah. 504th, 5th, and 6th. Right. All right. Uh, and okay, so you've got this pair, but how many of them did they put in the plane? About 19 in our plane. Okay. We had, and uh, it depended on the, the load the guys right. had. They had some of them had real heavy loads, and some of them did. But they'd go from like 16 to 19 in the plane. Yeah. And, and what? Impression did you did you have of these men as you were loading them on and carrying them over? They were they were, you know, trying to. They were good good humor. They were all kind of joking and so forth, and but they were all scared just like we were. Yeah. Did you have a sense that any of them had jumped before? Because the 82nd had. Oh, these been guys had all been jumping for quite a while. Some of them had jumped maybe 20 jumps. Mm -hmm. You know, they were. They but I meant in combat. Sort of, but not some of them in combat in, yeah. in Africa. Right. Some of them uh, down there, they were experienced guys. They were new guys. They mm -hmm. were all mixed together, and they were a bunch of good men. That's all. Uh, they, were, they were scared like we were, but you couldn't tell it. Okay. Now, how did the flight itself go? Can you kind of describe what happened? You take off from the airfield, and what? Well, you form into the way you, you take off well, pretty close, one right after another. And then you take a sharp turn to the left, and these left-hand turns, the first one went way out and took a sharp turn, and the next one not so far, and that's the way you catch them. When they come back, then you're catching up and getting into formation. Mm -hmm. And that, we did that for about 15, 20 minutes and a half hour even, getting into formation. And then they, the leader said, we're on our way, you know, and, and we took off for the, the route that we knew we were going to go on. That was to, to France. Okay. To, to Normandy. Right. Okay. Now, as you were flying, I mean, could you, did you, were you just flying in clouds or over clouds, or could you ever see down? Through them, above them, below them, and we had clouds all the time. And we'd see the planes, they would all be pretty close in, we'd, the guys would try to stay with you as close as they could and still see you. Mm -hmm. and, and the clouds were not real thick clouds, but they were, they were really bothersome. Did the planes fly with any lights on? No, they had three lights on each top of each wing and three mm -hmm. lights on top of the plane. And they were blue lights or mm -hmm. purple lights, whatever you want to call them. But those are the only lights. The bottom, the exhausts were all hooded with the right. exhaust dampers. So if you were at the right angle, you could see the planes around you, but only if you were at the right angle. Yeah, you could. Uh, that's that's about right. Except uh, we could see the planes most all the time, mm -hmm. except when a cloud would come obscure okay. it. And then it would come back right away, and we had to move over or move in mm -hmm. one or the other, you know. Okay. Then as you uh, get over the, the coast, did you take any anti-aircraft fire coming in? No, we didn't. We didn't, we didn't see a thing until we got to St. Mary Glees. And then we saw a ground fire coming up like crazy. Mm -hmm. It was, wasn't an anti-aircraft. It was small ground fire, mm -hmm. uh, 50 caliber machine guns and things like this with tracers in them. You can see the tracers that come right by your nose, you know, it's, it is pretty scary. Now, was that after you had dropped your paratroopers? No, before. Okay. So uh, were you going, as you're, you're, that area is a peninsula, the Kildentan, sticks up north toward England. Were you flying west to east across it or east to west? We were flying uh, kind of, uh, it would be northeast to southwest. Yeah. We kind of came at an angle. There. Okay, so you go past St. Mary Glees, kind of heading inland before you unload the men? Well, about, that's about where we started unloading, is at St. Okay. Mary Glees, St. Lowe, mm -hmm. St. Mary Glees. Well, St. Lowe was some ways away if you were yeah, there. Yeah, that was on beyond. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, now do you have any, I mean, what determines when you drop the paratroopers? Well, when, when the lead plane, when the lead plane has a red light on top and his light goes on, mm -hmm. we put our green light on in the back of the plane the guys start going out. And were you ever able to find out uh, how close those men got to where they were supposed to be? Yeah, we, we, we had a, Bob and I, we saw in, their, in their, our paper that they, the 101st was having a meeting here in Grand Rapids and the guys were all having a reunion. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, we called up down there at the hotel where, where they you know, described where they were staying and asked if they'd like to talk to any airplane pilots that dropped paratroopers on D-Day. Oh yeah, come on down. Yeah. So we went down there and for about two hours, Mom and I got chewed out about where these guys landed, how fast we were going when we dropped. You're going too fast. You didn't land uh, drop us in the right place. We, they, they griped at us for just as hard as they could gripe for a couple hours. And, and then uh, Mom says, why don't we go home? Or something like that. I said, that's a good idea. We got it out of there. Because all they wanted to do is chew us out. And they did chew us out. For, and they felt better about that. <laughs> yeah. Although, actually, the 82nd had a little bit better record of being dropped in the right place than the 101st did. Yeah. So, so you didn't even drop them. No, we dropped the 82nd. But they still griped. They yeah. still had plenty of gripes. Too far from them, too hard to drop. You were going too fast. You know, that hurts uh, their body when the parachute snaps them. Yeah. Now, when you were, you said you, you flew over San Mario Iglesias and there was fire coming up before you dropped the men. But did the fire affect your formation at all? Did people start to break I up? I think or? so. The weather affected our formation mm -hmm. much more than the ground fire. I don't think the ground fire affected us at all. It, we, we all could see it, but, mm -hmm. but the weather was tougher to fly through than the, than the flak. Okay. All right, you, so you, you successfully, you, you, the men jump off, uh, and then you just, just fly back out over the channel and go home? Or? Yeah, we, we hit the deck. We, we went down, right down on the ground, and our leaders would take us, and we would stay right in formation the whole way right back to our base. Okay, and why would you fly low? So that the anti-aircraft could hit us. Okay. And we'd come on them too fast. We'd come on them before they could get their guns up even, mm -hmm. you know. We, they would be standing there waiting around or something, and boom! You know, it's like a rocket coming over them. Right. Okay. Now, your day wasn't over yet, though, was it? You had more work to do? Oh, we had to go back and get a load of gliders. We had to bring gliders. Okay. Uh, and so how did that go? Well, the, the, the dropping of the glider it was, was, uh, it was a lot tamer than the paratroopers. I mean, less fire, less ground fire and so forth. And, but because they were all so busy with the paratroopers <laughs> on the ground that the, the, the enemy were, mm -hmm. that they didn't pay much attention to the gliders coming in. But the, the gliders, you know, they had these fields to land in, which were difficult fields with these obstacles. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, we, we, we recovered gliders. Did, have you been told about that? Well, they, they, uh, they did what they call glider snatching. And they, what they did is, like if you had a football field, they have two posts going up like goal posts. There are six by sixes and they'd go up in the air about 15 to 20 feet off the ground. And then they'd hang a, 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 a nylon, three quarter inch nylon glider cord across these two posts and then running it back to a, a, one of the gliders and stick it in the nose of the glider to hook it, hook it up. And then we'd bring our plane over at about 130, 140 miles an hour and we had a 15-foot boom that would come down from the plane and it had a big hook on it. And we'd come and hit it with that, the, the nylon cord with mm -hmm. that hook, and we'd pick the, the snatch, the glider is what we'd do. And we'd go from about 140 down to 90 or 85 or 90 miles an hour. And, the, and we had a winch inside the plane uh, with, that would spring loaded and it would pay out so to take the shock of the you know, pulling the glider off at the same time. And, and we'd take about three, three or four of them in a day when it was a good weather day, and we'd pick up three or four good gliders. Not that there weren't too many good gliders. <laughs> we had uh, about, uh, oh, each squadron had maybe two of these snatch planes. Mm -hmm. And we'd take them over there and do the snatching with them. And I did that on a couple of occasions. All right. Yeah, no, so once D-Day has happened, you know, you, you drop you did, done the, did the paratroopers, then the glider. You're doing glider snatching then at the, early in the Normandy campaign. What else were you doing at that time? Injured. We hauled a lot of injured people off. Uh, they would, uh, we had, you know, and, and the, as I said, the weather was bad. And we'd take mm -hmm. these injured, they, we'd get a flight nurse, we'd bring a flight nurse over, and we'd pick, pick up about 14, 15 uh, litter patients mm -hmm. and take them back over to England to a hospital there. On one occasion, which I mentioned in, this, in the write-up there, we, 
we, we got as soon as we got off the ground, you know, we, we got up in the air and we're headed toward England and land got land landing instructions and they said you're not going to land here. This is all closed in. You're going to have to go back to France and mm -hmm. check France. So they were all closed in too. So we we went to a place called Lands End, and it's right at the south end of England, and asked Lands End for. Uh, for them to turn their beacon on, their homing beacon, mm -hmm. and they said, well, we're not allowed to do that. Well, nobody flying today. Mm -hmm. I said, we're, we're up here by, by force only. I mean, there's no Germans around, so I said, they talked it over mm -hmm. and they turned it on. So then we took a 180 degree heading from that beacon and went out to the Atlantic Ocean <coughs> and went down to about 100 feet to, before we broke out. We broke out underneath the clouds. Mm -hmm turned 180 degrees and started back for Land's End. And uh, called about, oh, after we'd flown 10, 15 minutes, we called Land's End and said, please get eight ambulances on your landing field there mm -hmm. and uh, give us landing instructions on what runway is best for us to use. And we're on our way in, you know. And they said, okay, we'll do it, you know. They, they gave us landing instructions on the runway and about 10, 15 minutes, we just we slid it right down in on a runway, and they had the ambulances pulled right up there and unload them. And this poor nurse we had, this this flight took a, like two or three times the length of normally, and she has drips on everybody, and she's tending to their pains and you know giving them uh, medicine for that. And she's about just burned up that we you know that she'd worked so hard, mm -hmm. and she said she was so glad to get down. I said so are we. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, was that? Uh, I mean, did you see much of the nurses or the female military oh, personnel? Oh yeah, we would we would go we do that maybe one or two days a week. We'd mm -hmm. see these nurses, flight nurses, mm -hmm. and they usually fly over with us. We would get a load, come back, or there, sometimes the weather's bad, so we wouldn't get a load. We'd come back empty. You know, we mm -hmm. we'd done that too. And we usually always carried something over. We would carry gasoline. We would carry munitions. And, or we, we carry food. We always had a load going over, mm -hmm. but not uh, coming back. We many times would have these, these injured people. Right now, what kind of uh, landing facilities were there in France at that point? They would make uh, landing facilities for us. They had big steel mats, <clears throat> and these these steel mats. They would the engineers would spread these out on a pasture field, and they hooked together like this, you know. And we'd come in and land on these steel mats and uh, uh, try not to get stuck at the end where the mat ended and mm -hmm. so forth. And we'd turn around taxi back to the beginning of the mat so we'd load up and un we'd unload first and load up with whatever we were going to take back. And, but that's, that's what they had for landing strips, mm -hmm. is these steel mats on these pasture fields. How soon after D-Day were you doing that? Oh, I'd say... Ten days, okay. maybe two weeks before we got there. It took them a while to get those mats laid down. It took them a while to, to secure the land, you know, mm -hmm. to make sure there were no Germans around. Okay. Now, did you fly uh, just to the American areas, or did you also fly to the British sectors? I, I don't recall ever going to a British sector. I've landed on British fields and pulled British British par uh, glider pilots mm -hmm. or glider gliders. But I don't recall over there in France of being in a, in a British field. Okay. We, we stayed mostly in American fields. We had more area than most of them had to begin with, so that, well, that was no problem for us. I, I imagine we had more of their people on our fields, mm -hmm. would be my guess, and I, but I don't have any. Okay. Uh, now, but basically now, does this pattern kind of continue through the rest of the Normandy campaign? You have a couple yeah, months yeah. or so of this? Uh, this went on for, for uh, pretty, uh, maybe for a month, something like that. But let's see, all of June, mm -hmm. uh, most of July, yeah. I'd say, into August. Right. In August, we started working up toward Holland mm -hmm. and, uh, and Battle of the Bulge. And, Right. Uh, now, you get the breakout from Normandy is sort of end of July, beginning of August. Uh -huh. And then they move toward Paris and beyond, and the British head up into Belgium and this kind of thing. Uh, were you, once the breakout starts, did that change what your missions were? Were you flying to different parts of France now? Or? Yeah. We, we flew a good bit different parts of France. We'd, uh, we'd, we'd uh, 
maybe go way up in northern France and maybe maybe we go over to Belgium one day and uh, we, we, they, we just flew as, as time went on the, the destinations became you know a great deal different Be at the beginning right after the invasions they were all right around the invasion mm -hmm. areas and then we started spreading out which made it more interesting we'd stay overnight too mm -hmm. like we'd stay overnight in the town that uh, usually in the plane we'd sit in the plane over over there all right. Uh, now, what kinds of things did you commonly carry at that point? Well, gasoline was about, was about the most uh, prevalent. Uh, How do you? Uh, but we carry a lot of food. We mm -hmm. carry a lot of uh, ammunition. How do you transport gasoline in one of these planes? Because you don't have it's, big tanks. Yeah, it would, we would have uh, drums that would fit through that that double door we had. We'd have big round drums, and they'd sit there, and they. would they would bolt them to the floor, but they, they'd leak, and, and it really was, it was, it felt like you were going into a, an explosion thing when you walked through the plane, but we wouldn't allow any smoking when we had gasoline on. Mm -hmm. And we'd take the tanks out, when, they, when we got there, we'd take those tanks out, they had unloaded them first, mm -hmm. and then they'd take them out. Sometimes we'd take these five gallon, they'd, we'd do these five gallon tanks. We handled those once in a while, but usually we had big tanks, mm -hmm. and uh, we'd unload a whole lot of gasoline. Okay. Now, what kind of attrition did your squadron or group have between just wear and tear on the planes or accidents or enemy fire? I mean, were you losing many aircraft for one well, reason or another? C-47 is just an absolutely marvelous airplane. I mean, it's just hard to imagine a plane being built more safely, it landed better, it took off better, carried heavier loads. That plane rarely caused you to have a forced landing. I mean, it, it had to be something that was very peculiar. We just didn't have, our crew chiefs, we always said they really don't need you, do they, you know, and stuff like that. But uh, the, the, the uh, planes were just excellent. So we, we, when the gasoline was needed real badly, they, they, got, uh, they got what they called a C, C, uh, C3 or C9, I don't remember the number. It was a B-24 converted to a gas carrier, and we flew one other, two of those in, and uh, during this period of time, Pat was uh, mm -hmm. going up through there. He was sucking up gas faster than we could haul it. All right. So, uh, now, were there problems sometimes with the landing fields? I mean, you mentioned you didn't want to run past the yeah. metal sheeting on the fields. Yeah, we, we had some troubles with that. With, uh, you know, we just didn't have a whole lot. I mean, they, they did a pretty good. If they made them too short, we we, we never hesitated to advise them of their <laughs> shortcoming, and we'd get the field extended. But uh, I, I remember one thing that we when, when we take off from those fields, there were pasture lots, and there would be cows over in the corner, or someplace, and we just used to scare cows half to death. You know, I didn't see how they could ever milk them again. You know, they would just <laughs> they'd run as fast as a horse from these planes because. It was that that was that nerve wracking for the for the cows, but uh, we got uh, when we got into Holland when we were we were going down there on these market garden affairs, we had uh, going in t across the uh, across the the uh, English Channel there, we were having a lot of Germans coming at us. They they got wind that we were coming so. The, we, we complained like crazy, and they, they got P-47s and, and, and B, P-51s started coming to help us. And boy, did they ever tear those Germans up. It was just, that used to be a treat for us. You know, we'd be coming in there, and here the Germans are out there waiting for us, and the P-51s would come by, and those guys scattered. You know, they, the firepower of, those, of our planes were so great that it just, they just didn't want to be around them. Yeah. And at that point, we generally had better pilots because they had lost so many that the ones they had weren't as good as yeah, they used to be. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Although our pilots were pretty, pretty uh, young, too. <laughs> they, they were, you know, But they had a lot more they flight were, training time. We were building time. planes so fast mm -hmm. that we were building them up. Right. Uh, now, uh, for the market garden operation, uh, when on the initial landing, were you again carrying paratroopers yeah, or towing? We carried paratroopers first couple trips, then we carried a, a glider and then a couple, couple more paratroopers. All right. Now, were you carrying 82nd or 101st or? I, I don't know? remember that. I think it was 101st on mm -hmm. that that we had. 
Okay. It was, uh, and, and we, we had uh, British paratroopers too. Okay. We carried uh, uh, maybe one or two loads of British paratroopers. In fact, I, I was flying way back in a formation and they put a, uh, a lieutenant general or a brigadier general or something like that in my plane. And they, they gave special instructions about if, if somebody next to me got shot up or something, be sure to fill in right away, you know, don't make, draw attention to yourself in any way, you know, mm -hmm. because uh, because of this officer now, they wanted to get Did there. he drop or did he just take he, the ride? He jumped. Okay. All right. So, because there were, I guess, the, were the British were all landing all the way up at Arnhem. Yeah. Up in, in, in that sector. And I guess <clears> a couple of the, and there were several generals, but most of them landed on the, on the very first day. Yeah. They went in, in with their units. Um, okay. Now, on that first day when they're going over, was, were you encountering German aircraft then? Or? Uh, I don't recall. Okay. I don't recall that. But I, I, the re German aircraft started coming at us at the coast. Okay. And that was like after maybe two or three jumps. Okay. So once they figured out what was happening and the surprise was gone, they, they, were, they were trying to, yeah. to, to do that. And they would give it, they would, they'd hit us too. They would, we came back with a lot of holes through. Yeah, that's another thing about the C-47 had these sealed tanks. They could go through our gas tanks. Never, we never lost a plane because of a loss of fuel, you know, because they sealed up right away. Our planes could take, take it. C-47 is just un unbelievable. That's why they're still flying today. Mm -hmm because they're such great airplanes. Right. Now, during the Market Garden operation, the Allies were strung out in this kind of long, narrow corridor all over the place. Were you paratropping supplies to them? We did then? that. We do that. Uh, but not those. Uh, we, we dropped supplies every jump mm -hmm. because we'd have what they call pararacks right. under our plane. And, and on pararacks, there's six of them under each plane. And when the, after the paratroopers jumped, then we release the pararax. And we had one hang up on our plane one time. And this pararax had landmines in it. And it, it, it's, a, it's like a pallet. It's mm -hmm. like a big pallet full of landmines. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't, with this thing hanging down, with the, the, we couldn't land with that because that thing would blow high, sky high if we were to land with them. So we did a couple of you know, dips, you know, we'd go up maybe 5,000 feet and come down and pull out hard, but that didn't break the lines loose uh, that they, they held. So the crew chief said, why don't you let me shoot them down? And I said, what, what are you talking about? So I'll cut a hole in the bottom of the plane. I'll miss the controls going to the back. I know where they are. And I'll cut a hole and take a machine gun and spray those lines with, with machine gun fire. But she did. He cut this hole. It took him about a half hour to cut the dumb hole. And then he got this, this a grease gun, they called it, a small machine gun, mm -hmm. filled it with, with clips, and he shot about five or six clips on the lines. You just kept spraying, and then we took one up and did a dive, and the thing broke loose. So we went back, but this huge hole, it, it really cost a fortune to repair, I'm sure, but, but we got back safely. Okay. Now, after the market garden operation pretty much concludes, that's about October of 44. Uh, were you now back to regular supply runs for a while, or what was happening? Well, it, it wasn't long after that the thing was over. I mean, it, it ended pretty soon after that was, we were, after we got through all the people in there, and the British came, with it, they, they, they were marching down, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from the north to the, to, to Holland there. It didn't last much longer. We, that was probably the end of April or first of May, and we were we were out of there. Okay. Well, the April May that that's operate that's Operation Varsity. That's the crossing of the Rhine later. I mean, there's the Bridge Too Far campaign in, in, in September October, uh -huh. where they try to get to Arnhem and they're stopped and they and they and they don't get across. So that was one, and then there was a second campaign in March of '45 or first of April when the British crossed the Rhine up north. Yes. So I think maybe when you're carrying the British general, that's probably in that, yeah. that run I, there. Yeah, and I don't remember. So okay. You could surely... Okay. Now, do you remember uh, doing anything different during the Battle of the Bulge in December? No. I mean, the weather was so rotten that we didn't fly hardly at all. Mm -hmm. and the, when the weather first got got okay, we started, dro we dropped as quick as we fill our pararacks and go and release them and go back and get another load. Mm -hmm. yeah, but uh, we didn't... Uh, and would you fly over Bastogne where the paratroopers were or...? 
Yeah, we yeah. did that. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Now, what when you're you're based in England at, still at most of this time? Uh, what did you do when on the days when you couldn't fly? We sort of play poker, just you know. We didn't do much studying then. We were through studying pretty much, but we usually just play poker, or just watch for the weather. Okay. Well, could you get a pass and go into London or things like uh, that? I don't think so. I never did, and I don't know of anybody else that did. Other bases may have, mm -hmm. but we, we, yeah. we didn't do it. We get passes, but the pass would be after a month's wait for it. You know, right. You get a four-day or five-day pass. And did you ever get one of those? Oh, yeah. And, and what would you do with it? Well, I just went into London and walked, walked around Piccadilly mm -hmm. Circus and, and some of those places. I didn't do much of anything. Uh, we would we find a home to stay in, and then uh, people would ask us all about what we've been doing, what we were, and so forth. They all thought we were rich. You know, everybody thought mm -hmm. we were rich. All right. Uh, now, were you in, ever in, in London or in any place when the Germans were shooting the buzz bombs? Yes, I was at uh, north of London. Uh, we were over there when they were shooting, and they, they were shooting the uh, uh, V1s. They, mm -hmm. they, 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 you'd make the noise like a washing machine, then they'd stop, and then they were going to blow up. And they, yeah, we, we did that. Trying to sleep through that is very difficult. Did they ever uh, try to attack or bombard your base in England, or was that? Uh, never, never. We never had a German plane or anything that looked like one mm -hmm. come toward our base. I think we were too far away from them uh, to to uh, to get to us. Yeah, and you might not have been a high priority target anyway. That's right. Yeah. Uh, that's exactly right. So we we didn't uh, we didn't have that kind of trouble. Okay. Now, toward the end of the war, did you switch your base over to France? Yes, we had for the last three or four weeks. We were in France there before we we got out uh, before the war ended. Uh, before the Germans capitulated, about uh, on May third or fourth, we got on a ship to come back to the United States mm -hmm. to get new planes to go to Japan. Okay. Uh, now, what kind of facilities did you have in France? Oh, it was tense, it was lousy. And, you know, toilets were terrible. Everything was, everything was really bad. And, and when we were stationed in France, we, we wanted to go back to England. <laughs> but they, they had us over there. They're getting us ready to pack us up, ship us out. On May 8th, when that was uh, the day that the Germans quit, uh, we were on board a ship. We had met left. The, we had left yet, but we were ready to leave. Okay. So you weren't taking planes back with you, you were just being sent? We were leaving our planes there and getting new planes, coming back for new planes. Okay. And they weren't C-47s, they were Fairchilds, they were bigger planes. All right. Uh, now, what was the uh, trip across the ocean like? Beautiful. We, had, we ate like a king. I, I've, got, I've got menus, <laughs> the menus you wouldn't believe. They, we just ate beautifully, and, and the, the ship was... It was, the weather was pretty good, and the ship was a pretty good ship. So we had a, a very nice trip back to the United States. Yeah. From what kind of ship were you on? I don't know. I don't know. It was a Navy troop transport? Or I think it was a troop transport. Okay, so something built for that purpose yes, rather yes. than converted from something yeah. else? Or it was not a, a, a deluxe passenger job at all. Yeah. But it was a, the food was excellent. But it wasn't a Liberty ship either? No. It was, it was a good ship, and, okay. I, and I don't know what. All right. Now, then, uh, once you got back to the States, what did they do with you? Well, we, we went right away to right away to a base in, at Polk Field in, in, uh, down in North Carolina. Before we got there, though, we had a, a dental officer who had, didn't do his job at all. He, was, he lived in, in Leicester or Nottingham, someplace like that, the whole time we were there. And we got back and our teeth were all so bad. So we spent about three or four weeks, the, and the group did, getting our teeth fixed up before we could get down, uh, could even come home to see our, our relatives. And we got about a three or four week pass, and then we went to Pope Field and, and just started doing uh, work around the United States, with delivering mm -hmm. packages, mail, whatever. We just, just flew all over the place. And C-47s, mm -hmm. some old C-47s that they had. 
Now, did you ever get to the point where they were actually prepping you for Japan? Well, they, they uh, started talking about Japan and what the, the, what the real estate was like. I mean, the, what, what, you know, where we, the possibilities of invasion were and so forth. But we never got uh, really heated up on that because it just, they knew, somebody knew that a, a bomb was going to be dropped, which, which happened on August the 6th there. Okay. Now, where were you when that happened? Were you still at Polk? I, I, I was in Richmond, Virginia. I was on a, I've been on a delivery mission of a bunch of packages to Indianapolis. I'd come back to Richmond to get another load, and I, we got the news that uh, uh, things were coming to a halt. Okay. Well, this tape is... Okay. We had gotten to the point in your story when atomic bombs dropped, a war with Japan ends. Look back a little bit over the time spent in Europe. If you had to, to venture to guess, uh, how many missions do you think you flew while you were based in England and France? Well, I know the combat missions. There were eight of them. And I, I, right. I flew them. We only had eight when I flew them all. Mm -hmm. But on the daily missions, I, I would say probably 200, 250 out of maybe 400 days over there. Mm -hmm. And so to a certain extent, that's got to kind of run together in your memory. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I can't remember individual days except like this time when we got closed out of both fields. Right. That's, that's very vivid in my mind. But uh, my day, uh, daily routines, you know, when I'm taking fuel in or bringing litter patients back out, those things are, are just not well defined in my thinking. All right. Uh, now... When they announce that the Japanese surrender, uh, what basically happens to you and your unit then? Well, uh, I, I don't know when that when they announced it. I was in I was in uh, Virginia. Right. So I don't know what happened at the unit, but I got back a day or two later, right. and everybody was uh, thinking about what's going to happen. And they had a couple of options. You you could go to be a, a airline pilot, or you could could get out, or, or you could stay in and continue on with the, and each, they were all talking that over pretty heavily, you mm -hmm. know, and I, I was, uh, I had had an awful lot of flying, as I said, about, you know, 400 days, and that, that, uh, that, that or three, 200 days mm -hmm. out of the 400, that's a lot of flying, it was over a thousand hours, and I'd, I'd had enough flying for a while, so I, uh, I want, I said I want to go back to school. All right. Now, did you have to uh, stay on active duty for a while after the war ended, or keep oh, flying around? I think I think it was well, it was awful quick we got out because the the uh, Japanese quit on the what is the fourteenth of August. August. Yeah, we got married on the eighth of September, so mm -hmm. that that happened pretty fast afterward. I had a lot of leave. Right. Stacked up, and I could just about, you know, take that when I wanted to. So we went. We went on leave till October. Right. And then, then got out of the service. Okay. Uh, and then at that point, now, did you return to Ohio University or go somewhere yeah. else? Yeah. Uh, she had graduated from University of Michigan, so she tried to get me to go to Michigan, and I found out that all this horsing around I did that, that semester after they after I'd signed up. It didn't pay off at all. I mean, I couldn't get in Michigan for what I, unless I wanted to start out at day one. Mm -hmm. you know? So I went back to Ohio U and took up where uh, where I had passing grades. And but Michigan, they didn't just want passing grades. They want they want to up here. Mm -hmm. okay? So I I, uh, I went back down there and we got married just before the, the semester started. So we, we went back down there together and uh, we got a place to live, an apartment, or a house to live in, and then we moved from the house to an apartment later on. But they were so good to veterans there, gee, many, they just, telephones were furnished, everything was furnished for us. We just uh, just had good living, didn't we, Mom? Now, what did you study then? I graduated in engineering. I studied uh, engineering, and I didn't have a specialty at first, but then I ended up with industrial engineering, which is kind of a general okay. engineering. Now, as you were going through these college classes, uh, what proportion of the people there were veterans? 
Well, they were, uh, the veterans were a pretty slim picket. When we, when we got out, it was so quick after the end of the war that there weren't pretty many, many veterans in at Ohio. And, and we got treated like kings, you know. I mean, it, it just everything, if you're a veteran, everything was... Yeah. How long did it take you to finish up? A long time. <laughs> 48, I, or 80, let's see, I, 48 as I finished? 48. Yeah. Okay. Now, over the course of that time, then, were there more veterans coming into oh, the classes the next Gordon. year? Oh, they They changed. They had to build buildings, and they did a lot of things. They, with us, we had this house till we moved to an apartment. This apartment was just first class, and, uh, you know, that was real early in the game. Mm -hmm. But then uh, pretty soon it got so the apartments got pretty hard to get, and they, they were having to build, build buildings, especially married veterans, mm -hmm. which there were a lot of. You know, because they were so much older than, than the regular students. Were the veterans any better as students? Do you think than well, the regular? I thought they were better. I think they were. They, 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 were, they most all of them uh, wanted to get, uh, get at what they wanted in life rather than sit in school. Mm -hmm. So I think that the veterans were better students. At least that's my. It's something that I had heard from old professors long ago. That the veterans stood out a little bit yeah. from the others. Okay. Now, once you completed your degree, did you get a job then? Yeah, I had. Uh, her father was uh, was a vice president of a, a sheet metal company, and he offered me a job, and I, I went with him. I worked for him for three, four years, and I went for. And my family had a, a business weatherhead company in uh, in Cleveland had a place there and they asked me if I wanted to come there and I did. They were pretty short of people. And then I, I worked for them and they transferred me to a little town in western Ohio named Antwerp, Ohio. 1,200 people. <laughs> but they were building a new cement plant there at, uh, right close to Antwerp. So I rode over there and said, I'm an engineer. Would you need an engineer at this, at this cement plant? And they did, and they hired me, and I worked for the cement company for about the next 30 years. I, I made cement, you know, and that was uh, some gratifying work. I could be a plant manager and a vice president of a cement firm. Okay. So how did you wind up on the shores of Gun Lake, Michigan? Well, uh, we, we lived in this town where we had this great big family. And you know, uh, about a year before the first one got out of college, I took a trip around to the colleges. Uh, we, she wrote letters for us and introduced us, and we'd stop at each of these schools and go through the school. And we had three of our oldest boys with us. And the oldest one chose Aquinas College. Mm -hmm. we, we went in Indiana, we went to Ohio U, we went to Michigan, we went to all these schools that we knew about. And this one took Aquinas. And uh, ten, eleven of eleven of the family went to Aquinas in the end, and they met spouses here, mm -hmm. and they married and had their families. And we're sitting down there in Ohio. We have one kid left out of the thirteen that uh, was still down there. So we said, "The heck with this. We're going to move up to Michigan, where the where the crowd is." Mm -hmm. And so we sold our farm. We had a farm there. We sold that, and we bought this place. Mm -hmm. And we've been here 23 years now. All right. And this has worked out real well for us. Okay. Now, to look back at the time that you spent in the service, uh, how do you think that wound up affecting you? Good question. I, 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 uh, it makes you grow up pretty fast. I mean, you, you, uh, you're ideals for uh, for good times your ideals for for jobs they, they change as you get older you get different ideas on what you what you really want to do and I think uh, I think the time in, in service I think the time in service matured my my thinking that I didn't think so much about basketball anymore you know. thought about baseball. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole yeah. different story. All right. Uh, now, to look back at, at the time you spent, particularly in Europe, are there kind of any particular incidents or things that happened that, that tend to come back to you that you haven't brought into the story here yet? Uh, I, I think a, a 
militarily, I, the write-ups I gave you cover the, the things that come back to me. Uh, socially, I, I never thought much about, you know, the things that I did there. I never, uh, I mean, we weren't real close uh, to getting married at that time, and I, I did, uh, I really was active socially, but I didn't, uh, I didn't come near get married or anything like that over there, but I, I, I did, uh, did a lot of dancing and messing around like that. Oh, did they have dances on, on, on the base you were at or no, that kind of thing? They had, every town had a palais de dance. Uh, Nottingham had one, Leicester had one, London had 20 of them, but uh, we'd go to the Palais de Dance. One of the things that uh, comes to mind that now uh, that you've mentioned this is the Civil War wasn't quite over at that time. And we had men's, I mean black people's eating places, mm -hmm. we had white people's eating places. We had dorm the places you lived, the dormitories, facilities were black and white. And uh, that, for Ohio people, that was quite a surprise to us. I mean, we get in there, that, that, I just couldn't quite get over that. that they have, I couldn't go into a black toilet, you know, mm -hmm. because it was a black toilet, you know. How was it different than a white toilet? <laughs> and, uh, so you had that when you were training in the South? Was that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. When I first started training in, in Texas, for mm -hmm. example, you know, pretty far south there. <laughs> yeah. And so that, that was, uh, that was an amazing thing to me. And then when we got overseas, and we'd go to these Palladi dances, and they had the, 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 the they had the Red Ball Highway, which was a, a roadway of transportation for military supplies mm -hmm. through Paris and right. up through Germany eventually. Mm -hmm. And that was all run by black people. And so we had a lot of black people living where we lived. And uh, they'd go to these dances, and they, they tell these white girls they're night fighters, you know. <laughs> that uh, that was a kind of a common or kidding expression, but they'd get in some pretty tough fights, uh, the white guys and the black guys at these dances. Occasionally, that that always, you know, for no reason at all, other than your skin was different, mm -hmm. and we didn't we didn't have that kind of living at all where we were in Ohio. And, Michigan, for that matter, too. Now, did you see more of this um, at, when you were based in France, or was this when you'd go into the to big towns in England? This is in England. Okay. I, I never saw this in France. Okay. I, I, didn't, I didn't ever see this in France. Okay. But I did see it in England maybe four or five times, and that, that troubled me, you know, mm -hmm. that, geez, that's behind us, let's get rid of that war, okay. do this one. Yeah. Did you have much contact or interaction with the black troops, or were they always in different places? I never had any anything other than the picking up a load of stuff that we were unloading on mm -hmm. the plane, maybe. But as far as uh, uh, socially mixing or, or otherwise. Uh, or but even as working with them for uh, on missions or things like that, they'd unload some of the planes. Yeah. or. I, I, I'd be just, it was like anybody else. I, I mean, at those times, we were all white or mm -hmm. all black, or whichever we want to call it. Right. But, uh, but it was, uh, as I said, that was really, uh, that really, bothered me for a while when, we, when I first got down there to Texas. Mm -hmm. so that, that people were living that way now. And, and they say the war's over, but the hey. Right, yeah, and you know, it remained a reality for a good while after the war, too. Yeah. yeah. And today, younger people often aren't even aware of it, especially not white ones. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it really is over. We really elected a black president now, for crying out loud. All right. Uh, anything else you can think of you want to throw into the record here before we close out? Um, I don't, I don't uh, tell me things about uh, well, Mary and I, you know, we, we had uh, our differences and thoughts about college. She always thought Michigan was the living end. And, uh, I kind of thought it was pretty good too, but I couldn't make it in it. You know, my grades weren't good enough to get in. So that was... Uh, that was a downer for me that I'd blown that opportunity, which was certainly an opportunity that I blew. Mm -hmm. But uh, All right. I just, uh, I think that was one of the dumb things in, in my life, was the way I wasted that time. It kind of reminds you of the difference or the change in you between when you left and when you got back. Exactly. All right.
All right. Well, it makes for a good story, so I'd just like to thank you for taking the time to tell it to me today. Okay.